Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video we're going to be doing a review for Biology 2420. That's Microbiology for non-science majors. Uh, we're doing a review for Exam 1, so let's get started. Uh, please learn all of the names in Chapter 1. If we talk about, for example, Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek, uh, please know what his contribution was. And obviously his contribution was to microscopy, in this early pinhole microscope. We should also know what types of animals, uh, what types of creatures are studied by micro biologists, uh, bacteria and archaea are prokaryotic and in their own domains. And then you have the domain eukarya. These are the eukaryotes and microorganisms include the fungi, the protozoa, the algae, and other small multicellular animals such as worms and things like that. Okay, and we talked about bacteria, we talked about archaea. Obviously no uh, the difference uh, between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And remember that bacteria have cell walls of peptidoglycan. Uh, archaea do not have cell, cell walls of peptidoglycan and neither do eukarya. So what you can say is peptidoglycan is unique to bacteria. What about fungi? You may want to know the difference between molds and yeasts. They're both types of fungi, but molds are multicellular. They grow as long filaments. They can reproduce by sexual, asexual spores. Uh, and remember the long fili filaments, those are called hyphae, and those form a mycelium. This is fuzzy network uh, that you can see. Yeasts, on the other hand, are unicellular, uh, reproduce asexually by budding, though they could uh, also uh, produce sexual spores as well. Um, but they look more like overgrown bacteria, right? They're more uh, oblong shape, like egg shape. What else? We talked about protozoa. Remember that protozoa are uh, types of protists. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, protozoa are types of protists. A lot of them are single cellular. Uh, the, uh, a lot of protists, I should say, are single cell eukaryotes. And, oh, one thing you should know is that uh, protozoa are categorized and classified based on their locomotion, okay? Protozoa are classified based on their locomotion. Some are pseudopods, some have cilia, some have flagella, and actually some uh, do not move at all. They, d they don't have a mechanism to move. And we talked about algae as well. Okay, remember we talked about parasites such as worms. A lot of times microbiologists study these because it's the egg that gets ingested and causes the infection, and also viruses. You should know that viruses are not alive. Then we talked about these concepts here. What should you know? Uh, you should know what uh, spontaneous generation means. You should know that Francisco Reddy did this series of experiments with these jars and he was able to show that spontaneous generation of macroorganisms is not uh, uh, real by showing that maggots do not grow from the meat they are delivered from flies and Pasteur came along with his swan neck flask experiment to really put the nail in the coffin for uh, spontaneous generation and show that even microorganisms cannot form uh, spontaneously. He then went on to show that fermentation is caused by yeast, and uh, it is the yeast that undergo fermentation and produce the alcohol. He also went on, Pasteur also went on to develop pasteurization, which is this process of heating liquids uh, without really spoiling their taste, and that was uh, important in food and, and wine and beer production. Okay, then we talked a little bit uh, about, oh, sorry, we talked a little bit about uh, the germ theory. Uh, Pasteur developed germ theory, we should know that. 
Robert Koch, we talked about him. His big contribution was, well, one of the things was showing how anthrax forms. It's due to a bacteria called Bacillus anthracis. And how did he show that? First of all, he developed lots of techniques in the lab. You can see here those techniques. Secondly, he developed four postulates. And by following these four postulates, he was able to link a particular microorganism, uh, namely bacteria, to a particular disease. So you, what you should know for the exam, you should know these four uh, postulates. You should know the four postulates for the exam because it's very important. What did it show? It showed how um, a particular bacteria causes a particular disease. That's very powerful stuff. Again, you should know the contribution of Ignaz Semmelweis. You should know the contribution of Lister, Nightingale, Jenner. Okay, just know uh, what their contributions were. Obviously, you should also know that vaccines do not cause autism and vaccines are, you know, a very, very strong net positive for humanity. Um, next thing, you should know that Alexander Fleming uh, discovered, ac quite accidentally, he, he discovered uh, penicillin when he accidentally got some mold, uh, in this case penicillium mold, growing on a dish, and that dish seemed to inhibit bacterial growth. Okay, so that was it for uh, chapter one. Uh, focus on those concepts, and you should do fairly well. Okay, let's go on to chapter three, see what we have here. I'm just going to go through and highlight the, the important things right on the exam, but you should study every slide in these in these handouts. So again, you should know what prokaryotes are. Know these shapes, okay, caucus shape versus bacillus shape, uh, and also know arrangement, right, strepto versus staphylo. What is the difference? Know these shapes, vibrio, spirilla, okay. No, anything in bold, all of these terms, obviously learn these terms. There's a very self-explanatory. Know the terms in bold. All right. Uh, yeah, know that these are the eukaryotes, right, composed of. These are the eukaryotes down here, the algae, the protozoa, the fungi, the animals, and the plants. And, of course, eukaryotic cells contain membrane-bound organelles, and they are quite large compared to prokaryotic cells. Remember the glycocalyx, sticky substance, gelatinous substance made of sugar and protein, or both? Okay, uh, you should know the two types of glycocalyx, the capsule, slime layer, and know the difference between the two. Okay, we talked about flagella. And what do you need to know about the flagella? Um, well, first of all, you should know that the flagella uh, works by uh, spinning, like almost like a propeller. It does not beat back and forth like it does in eukaryotes, right? So the bacterial flagella spins like a propeller, whereas the eukaryotic flagella beats back and forth. That's something important to know. And, and how does the flagella work in prokaryotes? It's a run and tumble, run and tumble effect. And then we talked about the axial filament where there are uh, these flagella, but they're internalized in the cell wall or cell membrane. Um, actually, right outside the cell membrane. There, inside of the outer membrane. And remember what's important for those flagella? Those flagella cause corkscrew motility. Then we talked about fimbri, which are sticky, bristle-like projections for adhering to surfaces. We talked about the sex pilus, which allows for horizontal gene transfer, horizontal gene transfer between bacteria. Um, we talked about the gram-positive cell wall. You should know the structure of the gram-positive cell wall. You should know that it has thick peptidoglycan layer outside of the plasma membrane. You also have these tychoic acids. And then you should know 
the difference between that and the gram-negative cell wall. Gram-negative cell wall has a plasma membrane. It has a thin layer of peptidoglycan. And then you have the outer membrane, which has part of the outer membrane, this pink stuff, is actually called lipopolysaccharide, or LPS. This is, this is important because LPS contains a component, a lipid component called lipid A. And that lipid A, if it gets into your system, can cause uh, uh, sepsis and shock. It's actually very, very potent. Uh, it's a potent toxin. So you should know that lipid A is a component of the lipopolysaccharide, which is a part of the outer membrane of gram-negative cells. And, and lipid A is quite toxic to humans. Also, uh, lipid A is also known as endotoxin. You may also want to know that there are porins in the outer membrane, which allow for larger substances to cross the membrane. And then obviously you should know that some bacteria don't have a mem uh, sorry, some bacteria don't have a cell wall of peptidoglycan at all. And those are called the uh, bacteria without cell walls, and they usually are pliomorphic, which means they don't have a particular shape. You should know the functions of the cell membrane. We talked about uh, we talked about membrane potential. You should know that the cells have a negative charge at the surface, and this is why basic dyes stick to them. Okay, and that charge is due to membrane potential, this active transport of ions. What else? We should know. The difference between this on the left, this is simple diffusion, and these on the right, this is facilitated diffusion. What kind of molecules can do simple diffusion across the membrane? Small nonpolar molecules. What kind of molecules require facilitators such as channel proteins or carrier proteins? Those are the polar or charged molecules. And you should also know that water cannot cross the membrane. Uh, it needs a channel called an aquaporin because it's polar. Remember then we talked about osmosis. Which way does the water move during osmosis? The water goes from high concentration of water towards low concentration of water. So the water would flow to the right in this example. Now that's called osmosis, which is the diffusion of the solvent. If we were talking about dialysis, that would be diffusion of the solute that would be the pink dots here the pink dots would want to diffuse to the left the water would want to diffuse to the right do you remember tonicity in an isotonic solution the water concentration is the same inside and out in a hypertonic solution the water concentration is greater inside than outside so the water will leave the cell and in a hypotonic solution, the water concentration is greater outside of the cell, so the water rushes in. In uh, cells that don't have a cell wall, like our cells, that causes lysis, or the cell to rupture. In bacteria, that would not cause lysis because they have a cell wall. Then we talked about active transport. Obviously, active transport is movement of a substance across the membrane against the concentration gradient, and that's going to require energy. What's coupled transport? This is when two transporters are doing active transport and work together. What is group translocation? This is when a substance crosses the membrane and is modified as it does so. All right, then we talked about endospores, and you should know the steps. You should know the steps to endospore formation. So learn the steps to endospore formation. Obviously, know what the ribosomes do. Okay, and that really brings us to the end of this chapter. So, you know, focus on those things I mentioned, but also study every slide, and you can't go wrong. Okay. All right, so lastly, we talked about chapter four. Let's jump right into it. You should know that with a light microscope, light microscopes, uh, you cannot see things as small as viruses. Okay, with electron microscopes, you can. 
You should know what contrast means. You should know uh, what a bright field microscope is. Also, uh, about light, you may want to know that short wavelength light is higher energy, longer wavelength light, visible light is lower energy. Okay. You should probably know how to calculate total magnification. Uh, you should know the parts of the microscope. Do know the parts and the functions of the parts of the microscope here. You should know what parfocal means. Parfocal. Okay. We've talked about refraction. We talked about refractive index. When light hits, when light hits glass, you're going from air to glass. Air has a refractive index of only one. Glass has a higher refractive index, so light gets slowed a bit, but it doesn't bend because the light, in this example on the right, the light's hitting at the normal, right? And so even though the light's slowing, it's not bending. But if light hits at an angle, at it, as long as it's going from lower refractive index to higher refractive index, light will bend toward the normal. And then as it leaves the glass, it will bend away from the normal because now it's speeding up. It's going from 1.5 to 1. And this is, this is how prisms work. And, and basically a lens is a extended prism. Okay? A lens allows that light to fall at a focal point, F. Okay, that's the focal point. And there's a focal length. The focal length is a function of how thick the lens is. The thinner the lens is, the further the focal point. Okay, the thicker the lens is, the shorter the focal point. And if you have a concave lens instead of convex lens, then that actually even scatters the light. And it's all due to refraction. And if you have a perfectly flat piece of glass, then remember the light is hitting at the normal, so there's no bending, and the light goes straight through. Okay. Oops. Okay. Also, do you remember how immersion oil works? Immersion oil increases how much light makes it into the objective lens because immersion oil has the same refractive index as glass, and so the light does not bend, and the light gets collected by the objective. If you don't have immersion oil, uh, you lose a lot of light due to refraction and reflection. You should know what re resolution means. So obviously know the difference between resolution and contrast. And then we talked about each of these forms of microscopy. So do know each of these forms of microscopy. Bright field microscopes simply focus a cone of light onto the specimen. They're not great for viewing unstayed cells because you don't get great contrast. If you want good contrast, you look at these forms of microscopy here, dark field, phase contrast, DIC. So in dark field, what should you know? Uh, you, sh you need to know that in dark field, all of the light escapes the objective except the light that strikes a sample. This, the light that hits a sample gets refractive, it refracted into the objective, and so the samples appear bright. That increases contrast. How does phase contrast work? It increases contrast as well by putting the light that hits the sample out of phase and that light gets canceled out due to uh, deviation of wavelength, right? These opposite wavelengths cancel each other out. The specimen looks a lot darker than it should be. And so it's like an artificial way of staining without staining. DIC microscopes, what do you need to know about these? You should know that the image appears 3D, and it appears 3D because of polarity of light. There's a different polarity of light that reaches one eye than the other. And then we talked about fluorescence microscopy. You should know that fluorescence microscopy requires these fluorophores, which are molecules that absorb energy and then emit light. So the excitation peak, where they absorb, the excitation wavelength, what you need to know for the exam is that the excitation wavelength is always shorter and the emission wavelength is longer. Okay, never the other way around. Confocal microscopy, what do you need to know about this? Uh, simply that you take 
uh, it's it's you know it uses a computer to look at multiple levels, multiple planes through your specimen, and then render a three-dimensional fluorescent image. So it's almost like fluorescent microscopy, but you get to see 3D thanks to some uh, optical tricks and computer processing. All right, then we talked about staining. Staining is great because it increases contrast. You should know how heat fixing works and why you have to heat fix. You should know that basic dyes are positively charged. You should know that acidic uh, dyes are negatively charged. And we use basic dyes mostly for staining because the cells tend to be negatively charged. All right, then we talked about different types of uh, staining we should know what simple staining is you're just staining all of the cells you can what can you tell from simple staining shape and arrangement then we talked about differential staining uh, you should know that in differential staining you can differentiate between different types of organisms all right um, and you may want to know see uh, you may want to know that Crystal violet is the primary stain, iodine is the mordant, alcohol is the decolorizer, and safranin is the counter stain. Okay, and that'll also help you on the practical as well, I'm sure. Okay. You should know what negative staining is. This is when you stain the background, but not the thing you're looking at. So here in the capsule stain, you can see that everything's been stained except the capsule. Even the bacteria has been stained. Okay, and then we talked about electron microscopy. And what do you need to know about that? You should know that in, in electron microscopy, you're using electrons to resolve the image. So you're going to get way more resolution and magnification because electrons have a much, much, much shorter wavelength than, uh, than do light, right? And remember, it, the wavelength was 2.5 picometers, which is ridiculously small wavelength. Uh, and also, what do you need to know about electron microscopy? You need to know that you don't use glass lenses. You use electromagnets. And you don't use air. You have to suck out all the air uh, by vacuum. Okay, And you don't stain with uh, colors or stains. You stain with metals. Right. Now you need to know the difference between TEM, transmission electron microscopy, and... SEM, scanning electron microscopy. What you need to know is TEM gives you the highest resolution, even higher than SEM, but you look at sections. You're looking through an object, like looking inside of this section. But in T SEM, scanning electron microscopy, you're looking on the topography. You're looking at the surface of the objects. Okay because it scans the electron over the substance and you get to get a 3D view of the object. Okay. Um, what else? You don't need to know about scanning probe microscopy. I put this here just for fun because it's a very interesting type of microscopy where you can see tiny, tiny things. And uh, that's about it. I think we've covered everything. Uh, I tried to highlight some of the more tricky, more important things to know. It's a very straightforward test, and I think you'll do quite well if you take my advice and study these slides and, and know them as best as you can. Uh, so I hope you do well. Don't forget, uh, exam's coming up, and uh, I wish you well. Study hard, and uh, we'll tune in next time.